Can we just do another sound?
action, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Since we are working in a hybrid format today, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items before I proceed. I think sooner or later, we're all gonna know what the housekeeping rules are, but I will go over them again. Um, first, if you are experiencing connectivity issues, please make sure you or your staff contact our designated technical support so it can be resolved immediately. Members participating remotely must continue to use the video function for the duration of their participation in the hearing unless they experience connectivity issues or other technical problems that render the member unable to fully participate on camera. It is committee policy that members will remain muted when not recognized, just like turning your microphone on and off during a hearing in person. This is out of courtesy to all members on this committee and so that background noise does not interfere with another member who is recognized to speak. When you are recognized, you will need to unmute your microphone and pause for a couple of seconds before speaking so that we will be able to hear everything you say. If you wish to be recognized, please raise your hand using the WebEx raise hand function, unmute your microphone and ask to be recognized. In order to ensure everything members say is captured on the live stream of this hearing, I ask that members pause for two to three seconds before beginning to speak. If you wish to have a document inserted into the record, please ask for unanimous consent and have your staff email the document to veteranaffairs.hearings at mail.house.gov. Uh, it will be uploaded to the committee uh, document repository. Uh, please keep in mind that you will need to refresh the repository page as it does not automatically update. Without objection, members will be recognized in order of seniority for questioning witnesses. This makes it easier for me to make sure all members participating have an opportunity to be recognized. Uh, does any member have a question about the conduct of this hearing with members participating remotely? Uh, seeing none, I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. Good morning and thank you all for joining us here today, both those who are physically here in DC and those joining us remotely. Today, I'm looking forward to our discussion of reproductive health and veterans with a specific focus on women veterans. July 1st marks a major anniversary in the history of military women and marks the founding of the Women's Army Corps in 1943. In those days, women could be involuntarily discharged for becoming pregnant, a reprehensible policy that remained in place until 1976 and resulted in the discharges of thousands of service women. On Friday, I introduced a bill directing the General Accounti Accountability Office to conduct a study regarding women involuntarily separated from military service for pregnancy or parenthood and to identify any racial or ethnic disparities or irregularities that may have caused those women to have been wrongfully denied access to veterans benefits. Today, both service members and veterans receive a wide array of gender specific reproductive care and services have continued to expand over time. Veterans can receive such services as contraception, including plan B, maternity care, breast and cervical cancer screenings and treatment and treatment for menopause. However, limitations on services available disproportionately impact women, LGBTQ veterans, and veterans living in poverty. These include limitations on infertility care, particularly in, in vitro fertilization, non-directive abortion counseling, abortion care, and gender-confirmed surgery. I want to be clear, these services are essential health care services that are critical and necessary for the physical and mental well-being of our nation's veterans. No veteran should be denied these services simply because they get their care through the VA. On Monday, the Supreme Court struck down a Louisiana law that sought to restrict reproductive freedom and abortion access. This case further highlights 
how denying veterans access to health care within a system that they rely upon imposes prohibitive geographic and financial barriers on women. While in some cases expanding services requires congressional action, which we have taken, um, uh, there in others, the secretary has the power to make changes by regulation. I call on Secretary Wilkie to prioritize reproductive care and expand medical care to include abortion and abortion counseling. Further, furthermore, we know uh, horrifyingly little about veteran maternal mortality, but the information that we do have should concern us. First, black women and indigenous women are for, far more likely to die in childbirth than white women, and many of these deaths are preventable. Second, we also know that more than 30% of women veterans who use the VA for their health care are black. Third, women veterans, regardless of race, experience more complicated pregnancies due to service-connected conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder. VA should collect and publish data on maternal mortality, disaggregated by race, age, and tribal affiliation, alongside other data already published on reproductive health. I applaud VA Acting Deputy Secretary Powers on hosting a long overdue Women Veterans Forum last week. I understand that many veterans were also shut out of the event due to the phone line being full with thousands of participants. This should signal to VA's most senior leadership that specifically addressing the needs of women veterans should not be a mere nicety and should be the norm. I hope VA from the secretary on down takes this as an opportunity to listen and learn rather than patronizing and minimizing. Women veterans do not want lectures on why the VA's mottos historic nature is justification for erasing their existence. They want to and must be acknowledged for their enduring service to our country. It is insulting to this nation's two million women veterans, as well as LGBTQ veterans, caregivers, and survivors to spend tax dollars on bronze plaques when VA facilities go, go years without adequate privacy curtains or OBGYN staff. Finally, we must acknowledge far too many veterans who are women and LGBTQ experience interpersonal violence before, during, and after their service, including military sexual trauma and intimate partner violence. It is therefore even more urgent VA provide trauma-informed, comprehensive, reproductive health care. Today, we will hear from VA, Paralyzed Veterans of America, and and the Center for a New American Security on how we can best meet the reproductive health care needs for those who have borne the battle. I welcome you all and look forward to your testimony. With that, I would like to recognize Dr. Dunn for five minutes for any opening remarks he may wish to make. Dr. Dunn? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm once again glad to be back at work in person at our nation's capital, tens of millions of workers across our country have been working in person since this pandemic began, and I believe Congress should be doing the same, leading by example, especially during these difficult times. During today's hearing, we'll be discussing veterans' access to reproductive health care through the VA health care system, the demand for high-quality, accessible reproductive health care within the VA is increasing along with the number of women veterans and male veterans with genital urinary trauma and spinal cord injuries, which are especially common sequelae of explosions and landmines. As a urologist, these issues are very familiar and very important to me. I'm grateful that the VA offers veterans a wide range of services to meet their reproductive health care needs. I look forward to learning more about those services this morning, as well as learning about how the VA is continuing to provide access for needed reproductive care during the pandemic quarantine. For veterans experiencing infertility and erectile dysfunction, delaying care can have devastating consequences. I appreciate the work that the VA has done to shift as much care as possible to telehealth over the last few months to avoid the need for veterans to travel and potentially expose themselves to contagion. However, as we learn in last week's subcommittee hearing, telehealth is an imperfect 
substitute for traditional in-person medical care. The VA must utilize every avenue available to make sure that our nation's veterans continue to receive their reproductive care, including without unnecessary delay. If this committee can take any action to remove a barrier to care, for veterans in that regard, I want to know about it. I appreciate our witnesses from the VA for being with us here in Washington today and our witness from the Paralyzed Veterans uh, of America and the Center for New American Security for being with us virtually. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dunn, and we are delighted today to have Dr. Rowe joining us. Dr. Rowe, would you like to make any opening comments? No? Okay, with that, let me introduce our witnesses uh, from VA's Veterans Health Administration. We have uh, Dr. Patty Hayes, Chief Officer, Women's Health Services. She is accompanied by Dr. Alicia Christie, Deputy Director of Reproductive Health, Women's Health Services. For our non-government participants, we are joined virtually by Mrs. Maureen Elias, Associate Legislative Director, Paralyzed Veterans of America, Ms. Kayla Williams, Senior Fellow and Director, Military Veterans and Society Program Center for a New American Security. Both Mrs. Elias and Ms. Williams are veterans of the U.S. Army, so thank you for your service to our country. And I will remind our witnesses to please pause for two to three seconds before speaking so that so the recording will capture all of your words. And please remember to do so when answering members' questions. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, your written statements in full will be included in the hearing record uh, without objection. So with that, I now recognize Dr. Hayes for five minutes and welcome. Good morning, Chairwoman Brownlee, Ranking Member Dunn, and distinguished members. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the high quality care and support that VA is providing to our women veterans. I am accompanied today by Dr. Alicia Christie, Deputy Director, Women's Reproductive Health, Veterans Health Administration. The number of women veterans enrolling in VA healthcare is increasing, requiring ongoing enhancements to our VA's healthcare system. Women make up 16.9% of today's active duty military forces and 19% of National Guard and Reserves. And based on the upward trend of women in all the service branches, the expected number of women veterans using VA healthcare will rise rapidly. And more women are choosing VA for the healthcare than ever before, with women accounting for over 30% of the increase in all veterans served over the past five years. VA provides full services to women veterans, including comprehensive primary care, gynecology care, maternity care, specialty care, and mental health services. Women veterans are offered assignments to trained and experienced women veteran, I'm sorry, uh, experienced designated women's health primary care providers. And these providers do provide uh, pr general primary care and gender specific primary care in uh, the context of the longitudinal relationship. VA has made a commitment to be fully equipped to address women veterans' complex and unique needs. VA offers reproductive health care and gynecologic services tailored to women veterans across their lifespan, including contraceptive services, infertility, access to maternity care services, specialized gynecology care, as well as management of menopause and associated reproductive health conditions. During the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, when all routine visits and non-urgent procedures were suspended, VA providers leveraged VA's robust telehealth technology to continue to provide needed reproductive health care to women veterans. Across VA, we've seen 1,000% increase in telehealth video appointments since March 1st, with a 1,900% 1, increase in video telehealth appointments for women veterans. Recognizing the need to support women's reproductive plans during major disruptions such as natural disasters and pandemics, Women's Health Services created guidance for the field on innovative ways to deliver contraceptive services, including leveraging telehealth technologies and considering alternative means to administer injectable contraception. Additionally, VA provides access to infertility services for enrolled eligible veterans. Access to these services have been affected by COVID-19 across the national healthcare landscape. The American Society of Reproductive Medicine, ASRM, called for a postponement of all but the most urgent care during the early days of the pandemic in order to avoid placing extra burdens on stressed healthcare systems. At that time, ASRM recommended delaying diagnostic evaluation and infertility treatments. 
veterans, like all Americans receiving infertility care, have been affected by these delays. But today, professional reproductive medicine organizations have concluded that successful mitigation efforts allow for the selective resumption of infertility services depending on local resources and community reopening guidelines. Women's health services have communicated regularly with VA providers in the field, updating them about these changes in access to infertility care through the pandemic. And in order to minimize disruption in care, the providers have been encouraged to continue placing the consults for community care and fertility treatment in order that veterans will be provided with appointments as early as possible. The COVID-19 pandemic has also had impacts on pregnant and breastfeeding women veterans. Concerns about access to prenatal care, potential risks associated with infection, and limited numbers of support people during labor have created increased stressors for pregnant veterans. Women's Health positioned maternity care coordinators in our field to serve as valuable resources for pregnant veterans to help manage these concerns. Maternity care coordinators reached out to every pregnant veteran receiving care through services in the VA with specific resources and information related to pregnancy, childbirth, and breastfeeding during the pandemic. Routine prenatal care has been modified in almost every community in our nation to reduce exposure of pregnant women to the coronavirus and prenatal care has been modified to reduce the number of prenatal visits and provide care virtually. VA responded to this modification in care by offering use of telehealth technology for prenatal visits, as well as creating infrastructure and processes to provide needed equipment for these community maternity visits, such as providing handheld fetal Dopplers to veterans. VA has continued to enhance delivery of reproductive health care to veterans and has implemented an aggressive public health response to protect and care for our veterans and their families in the face of the current pandemic. Maintaining access to essential services such as contraception, mental health services, and intimate partner violence support and intervention is especially crucial during this time. Your continued support is essential to providing high quality care for all veterans and their families. Madam Chairwoman, this concludes my testimony. My colleague and I are prepared to answer any questions. Uh, thank you Mr. very much, Dr. Hayes. And I now recognize Mrs. Elias for five minutes. Chairwoman Brownlee, Ranking Member Dunn, Ranking Member Rowe, members of the subcommittee, and other members of the committee, Paralyzed Veterans of America is grateful for this opportunity to provide input as you examine the Department of Veterans Affairs Reproductive Services and its- Excuse me, Ms. Ilias, well, you're, you're um, not coming through very loudly or loud enough here in the hearing room. Is there a way in which to fix that to the technical people behind the scenes here? For the technicians, we can't hear the testimony in the hearing room. Ms. Elias, you want to give us a, a test to see if you're any louder? Sure. One, two, three, four. Much, much better. Okay. Excellent. And if you don't mind starting from the beginning, that would be helpful. Absolutely. Reset the Absolutely. clock, please. Welcome again. Okay, thank you. Chairwoman Brownlee, Ranking Member Dunn, Ranking Member Rowe, members of the subcommittee, and other members of the committee, Paralyzed Veterans of America is grateful for this opportunity to provide input as you examine the Department of Veterans Affairs Reproductive Services and its continuity of care during major disruptions such as natural disasters and pandemics. Following the tragic events of 9-11, PVA member Chris Hull felt a strong call to serve. He was gearing up for a deployment to Iraq when his military career was cut short in a horrendous vehicle accident, leaving Chris with quadriplegia. He worked hard to regain his abilities and is now an avid wheelchair rugby player, as well as a peer mentor for veterans with newly diagnosed spinal cord injuries, or SCIs. Following his accident, he met and married the love of his life, Ash, and they wanted to start a family right away. Chris had been informed by his physician that the couple would not be able to conceive without in vitro fertilization, or IVF, which they could not afford. 
So they were thrilled when Congress authorized VA to provide IVF services. On April 25th, they welcomed their baby girl, Penelope Jane, into the world. This good news story and others like it is what this benefit is all about, restoring to veterans what has been lost in service to the fullest extent possible. While we are very excited that procreative services remain temporarily available for catastrophically disabled veterans and thrilled to learn when veterans and their spouses are expecting, our work is not done. Chris and his wife would like to grow their family, but they now face the choice of rushing to have a second treatment before Ash's body has had a full chance to recover because they are worried the service might not be reauthorized. If this service is not reauthorized, veterans who lose reproductive ability due to a service-connected injury will once again bear the total cost for any medical services should they attempt to have children. Moreover, the uncertainty of reapproval every two years is very disruptive to the veterans family and financial planning. We urge the members of this subcommittee to support legislation like HR 955, the Women Veterans and Families Health Services Act of 2019, which would make this service a permanent part of the medical benefits package at VA. Sexual function after an SCI is correlated with quality of life. As one woman veteran with an SCI stated, just because I cannot feel the sensations doesn't mean I don't crave and want to share that intimate experience with my husband. In fact, improving sexuality is a main priority for people with paraplegia. Providers need to initiate conversations about sexual health, desire to have a family, and incontinence with men and women veterans with an SCID when they first enter VA's SCI system of care and at various touch points during their lives. VA already has training programs to educate providers on the reproductive cycle for veterans. PVA suggests they could go further to develop training scripts that ask veterans questions like, would you like to have a family? Are you having sex? Are you enjoying it? Doing so would reduce discomfort of providers in asking these types of questions and increase the likelihood that they will be asked. Unfortunately, there is a glaring lack of research on reproductive health of veterans with SCID. In the past, attitudes that individuals with SCI should be happy to be alive and need to learn to live without sexual pleasure have clouded research, and if and when research was done, focused solely on matters of fertility and reproduction. PVA wants to ensure VA is empowered to provide individualized and well-coordinated sexual health interventions specific to the cultural, religious, physical, emotional, cognitive, sexual orientation, and gender identity needs of the patient served. However, until we have this information, we cannot understand all the various factors that come into play in reproductive health. There is always room for improvement in meeting the gender-specific health care needs of catastrophically disabled women, but one of the biggest our issues our members report is accessibility to that care. In evaluating VA's response to natural disasters and pandemics, our main concern is the accessibility of benefits and services. Veterans may delay or be able to, unable to obtain reproductive care during natural disasters. Putting off breast examinations, pap smears, and prostate exams gives unidentified cancers the chance to fester and delays time-sensitive treatments. PVA would once again like to thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to present our views on VA reproductive and related services and would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. And now, finally, I will recognize Ms. Williams for five minutes. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I hope the audio is coming through fine. Chairwoman Brownlee, Ranking Member Dunn, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss a topic I believe is of vital importance to the overall well being of America's veterans, since reproductive health is a core component of overall health. My perspective on this is partly professional. I formerly ran the Center for Women Veterans, and my research portfolio includes women veterans' health needs. In addition, I adopted my son a decade ago after experiencing infertility and have since given birth to my daughter and experienced a miscarriage that required medical assistance. The need for comprehensive care to facilitate family planning in a safe, dignified, respectful environment is therefore also deeply personal for me, as it is for so many women. In terms of reproductive health care for women veterans, there are areas in which VA is excelling and truly leading the way. However, there are also matters of law and policy that demand change in order to provide equitable care to all women veterans. 
Within VA, patients receive comprehensive, integrated care from a patient-aligned care team, and VA has trained over 7,000 providers and nurses through Women's Health mini residency programs to enhance their skills. These measures contribute to VA's ability to provide higher quality care, such as conducting breast and cervical cancer screenings at higher rates than any other sector. Another best practice is maternity care coordinators who support pregnant women veterans throughout pregnancy and into postpartum. MCCs ensure women veteran mothers are able to access an array of VA benefits, including not only a breast pump, but also nursing pads, nursing bras, nipple cream, and breast milk storage bags, as well as the innovative telehealth options that Dr. Hayes mentioned. While I laud VA's success in these key areas, there are three issues in which VA has neglected to take action for so long that I now believe they require congressional attention. In vitro fertilization, contraception, and abortion. First, infertility affects roughly 12% of married women, but VA's medical benefits package specifically excludes IVF. Congress authorized VA to cover assisted reproductive technology for veterans and their spouses solely when a service-connected disability caused the infertility. This excludes unmarried veterans, same-sex couples, and those who cannot provide their own gametes. Purposefully or not, this discriminates against LGBT veterans, an inequity that should be immediately eliminated by expanding access to all veterans eligible for VA care. Costs can be restrained by requiring single embryo transfer in most cases, reducing the number of expensive and dangerous multiple births. Second, VA can and does charge many women veterans co-payments for birth control. Access to affordable contraceptives is an essential component of comprehensive health care for women. Since VA patients tend to carry a heavier health burden and be poorer, charging women veterans a copay is particularly galling. Representative Brownlee has already introduced a bill that would prohibit VA from requiring payment for contraceptives from veterans, the Equal Access to Contraception for Veterans Act. I urge the House to vote on this bill promptly. Note that CBO's cost estimate does not take into account the reduced cost related to prenatal delivery and postpartum care that would likely lead to overall lower costs for VA. Third, VA's medical benefits package currently excludes abortions and abortion counseling with no exceptions for rape, incest, or life endangerment of the woman. This means a woman could leave active duty because she was sexually assaulted and expecting to receive the same services she could get in the military, walk into VA the next day, but no longer be able to access care she and her provider agree is vital to her well-being. This exclusion means a woman veteran in a precarious financial situation due to the pandemic will not be able to decide what is best for her family during this challenging time. It means that women veterans are not able to get apportioned coverage comparable to women using Indian Health Service, Medicare, TRICARE, the Peace Corps, Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, or in federal prisons. That is an appalling inequity that must be alleviated immediately. How is it just or even possible that because I'm a veteran, my doctor would be prohibited from saving my life with a safe, simple procedure. However we feel about abortion, we should not deny it to women veterans just because they use VA, thus taking away their ability to make important personal decisions about their health and futures with dignity and respect. The most effective way to resolve this issue for women veterans would be for Congress to pass the Each Woman Act, lifting the discriminatory Hyde Amendment entirely and restoring abortion coverage for all women, regardless of how we get our health care. At a minimum, however, this potentially deadly component of VA's medical benefits package should immediately be eliminated. VA should be lauded for its exceptional rates of breast and cervical cancer screenings, ongoing efforts to improve the number of women's health primary care providers, and excellent MCC program. However, its long-standing inaction on achieving equity and access to IVF, contraception, and abortion makes it clear that Congress must act to address these gaps. Women veterans step forward to serve at great risk. Now Congress must step forward and ensure that they can access the full spectrum of health care they deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony, uh, Ms. Williams. And uh, Ms. Elias, I have been mispronouncing your name, so uh, deep apologies, and I will do better the next time, so I apologize. Um, again, a reminder, last but not least, to my colleagues that members should pause two to three seconds before speaking so that 
all of your questions are captured, and I now recognize myself for five minutes of, of questioning. My first question goes to Dr. Hayes, and um, there's been a lot in, in the witness uh, testimonies uh, uh, regarding IVF. Um, and IVF is uh, now part of a service that VA offers, and that's the good news. Um, I think there are there's some more ironing out that needs to take place, and obviously it needs to be a more permanent program. But for the 500 or so uh, veterans that we have served uh, in the IVF program, we've heard from many that when it comes to the the billing part of all of this, it gets very muddled, um, and some refer to it as, um, you know, the, the the triangle in that we have, uh, you know, the the VA, we have the third party administrators, and then we we separately have the fertility clinics, and so kind of three entities uh, involved. And sometimes when it's coming to bill uh, uh, billing, people are pointing fingers um, at each other and not really resolving the problem. So I wanted to. You know, wanted to know if you could address that, but I think the more important question here is um, it, it, within the VA, is there one singular person um, who really oversees this IVF process? Uh, you know, from from the very beginning, the eligibility determination, all the way until the end, including the the whole billing process. Is there one person that's absolutely involved or responsible? Thank you for that very important question. We have long been concerned about our limits to IVF and our management of the IVF program in terms of being make sure that we serve this very important subset of our population that wants to have families. We have established a uh, a little bit about a year ago, actually, a, a much more comprehensive IVF management team. I'm on it. I get emails about every IVF patient, and every case comes to that team to make sure we have all the right information, uh, all of the needed uh, referral information and the authorization information. And we work very closely with the TriWest PC3 team that has complex case management now on these veterans. So a very small team, there's not one person, but the, the email comes to everyone. I have to say that we had not been brought to our attention the issue of billing because we'd been working very closely with TriWest on these cases. So billing cases need to come to my attention and we will pursue them immediately. We know that there are gaps sometimes in the understanding of the providers of how to bill VA, but I'd like to close those gaps. Uh, well, thank you for that, and uh, and we absolutely will. And you know, I was very involved in the first IVF uh, legislation, and certainly the intention of that legislation was for it to be a permanent program. Um, and obviously, VA once they uh, wrote the regulations, uh, then didn't I mean didn't really make it a per permanent program. We have to reauthorize it every every couple of years. So I I hope we can move forward on that. The, the other thing uh, with uh, IVF uh, eligibility really is, and many of the witnesses have pointed this out, that um, you know, uh, IVF uh, within the VA doesn't uh, include surrogacy. Um, it, if, um, if there's a lack of gamut uh, donations, uh, it doesn't, uh, you, you are prohibited from IVF, which is to me is just, is truly unexplainable. Um, these are probably likely the most, the people who most uh, need IVF, but, um, but you, but you can, but you can also, uh, there's no prohibition on the artificial insemi insemination on this. So it just, that doesn't make any, any sense. Embryo adoption is another problem. Um, for those who might have some religious objection um, um, and want to adopt uh, existing embryos um, rather than making multiple em uh, embryos. And then, as mentioned in the testimony, unmarried veterans, same-sex veterans, single veterans are all excluded from, from the program. And so the question is, does the VA have any idea of how many veterans um, who wanted to access the program uh, and, and couldn't, do you, do you collect that data? 
um, and do is the is the VA open to fixing these barriers to the program? We are very open to fixing the barriers. Unfortunately, we are actually handcuffed by the law, the appropriations law, which referred us to do no more than the 2012 DOD policy. And so we cannot fix that without legislative relief. We could get back to you on numbers. We did estimate numbers of the entire group of veterans who might want IVF you know, some time ago, and we could update that and get back to you in terms of that versus the current population that we're able to serve who are service connected. But these issues, I've talked to about 70 couples myself personally who were excluded from the benefit to explain to them how and why that occurred. Uh, so out of, you know, we had the 500 plus I've talked to, I'm, there's many more, there's many more. This, this particular policy does restrict our ability to serve these most needy veterans and their families. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I appreciate it. Uh, my uh, time is up, and so I will now recognize uh, Ranking Member Dunn for five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I will endeavor to keep my questions short so that you will be able to keep your answers short and we can get more questions done. Dr. Hayes, what percentage of veterans' services, infertility services, are provided inside the VA system as opposed to in the community? Uh, sir, thank you very much. I think we'd have to define a little better what are the infertility services you were being. So the ones that are on that list that, that are in the memo that came with the thing. And, and I'll take that, by the way, for so you can get your staff to answer back to Colonel Hill at some later point. I just, I'd like to get a sense of what that is. Uh, what percentage of the VA medical centers offer infertility care? All of the VA medical centers offer infertility care in-house in the beginning evaluation, so a urological evaluation, a gynecological evaluation. So they don't all do vasovasostomies. They don't all do IVF. No, so, no, the IVF is all in the community. It's all in community oh, okay. providers. Okay, so those, those are kind of the answers I'm looking for exactly. Uh, so for uh, what is the current wait time for an outpatient visit in the VA now, given the quarantine and pandemic, and also in the community care setting? I'm current sorry. wait times, outpatient. Uh, I do not have with me today the current information. Okay, if I'll, I'll take that information again, Colonel Hill. Um, uh, Dr. Hayes, how common are your general injuries and pelvic trauma among the VA's patient population? Dr. Christie, do you have some information to... So, you know, I, we all know that we see a lot of people right. with IEDs and other right. explosions. We had been working with the Department of Defense, and there's been some very interesting uh, research articles accounting for the number of blast injuries for uh, men out of the DOD environment. Men and women. Yes. And I think DOD would be a great source for that information, but yes. they become yours. Yes. Uh, 100%. So Precisely. I think that's a number we should, get, again, get our hands around and, and share, if you would, with Colonel Hill. Uh, Dr. Christie, uh, what percentage, uh, well, you, hmm, okay, this is kind of similar to the previous question, but what percentage of infertility services are provided to male patients? Uh, good morning, uh, Chairwoman Brownlee, Ranking Member Dunn, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank Short answers, Remember, Short answers. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you for that question. I would have to get the exact number uh, to you. I would like to get a sense of that. I think that's, you know, I'm a urologist, so I'm familiar with male infertility, and, and, and I have some interest in seeing how you're doing with that. Dr. Hayes, you look like Yes, I was going to say about 50% of the IVF cases are males with service-connected disorders eligible for the IVF. Not surprising to right. me. Um, uh, not surprising at all. Thank you. Uh, do you commonly offer vasovasostomies, the vasectomy reversals? Is that uh, something I'd find at half the medical centers, maybe? Um, it is one of the covered services. We have an infertility expert and policy work group and Dr. Carol Bennett who's the chief consultant for the urology, is uh, a member of that group. But I would have to get the exact number for you. Um, that is a covered service, but it's my understanding that... Yeah, they're, 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 the oh, even among urologists, not a, you know, it's not half of them. It may not be a quarter of them that actually provide that service right. you know, nationally. So I would be surprised if every one of your centers provides that, that service. But it's, you know, it's an essential service. All right, so uh, of interest. Dr. Hayes, 
Uh, what's the average waiting time to see a gynecologist in the VA system outpatient visit versus community care? The average times are very similar uh, in the VA system pre-pandemic. So in March, it was about 45 days in the VA system. Um, and depending on the community that someone was in, it, it would be actually a little bit longer to see a gynecologist in the community, more like how, 60 days. How about in the, did you have any feeling for the last three months? So much of our service has been virtual. There actually hasn't been waiting times for the appointments, but there are a few things that one can do as a gynecologist. Yeah. About 30% of the activities can be medical consultations, et cetera, that can be done by telehealth. But when you need an exam, you need to come in-house. We've opened up that as one of the outpatient procedures that's certainly available where we're opening the centers. So, I, I, and I'm not surprised to hear that, and I, you know, I certainly don't hold that against you. I would say that urology is another one of the specialties where you know, it's hard to perform a, a, a good examination. Uh, by telehealth. Uh, so recognizing that, thank you for your help on all those things. I look forward to your answers uh, just offline, and I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Dunn, and I now recognize uh, Mr. Lamb for five minutes. I understand he is having some technical difficulties, so he will be joining us by telephone. Mr. Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, appreciate all our witnesses joining in. Uh, Dr. Hayes, I, I wanted to ask about um, the shortage of OBGYNs in the VA system, uh, which I kind of saw with my own eyes in Pennsylvania. Um, last year, I did a visit to some of the VAs and, and met one of the OBs that was uh, covering like a multi-hundred mile territory of clinics and hospitals on his own. Um, with all the hiring that VA was able to do in March and April, were you guys able to make a dent into that problem at all? Good morning, Mr. Lamb. Uh, we were not focused on hiring GYNs uh, during the pandemic response. It was for uh, nursing and inpatient primarily so that we could cover COVID. The, right now we have gynecologists on staff uh, at uh, all but 24 out of the 140 VA medical centers. And those particular 24 do not have surgery on site, so there otherwise would be no support for the gynecologist. We use the Mission Act considerably to make sure that women have access to gynecology in the community. Right, okay. Um, do, can I take from your comments that there's not necessarily a concerted strategy to try to hire more on behalf of VA? We continue to try and recruit gynecologists and primary care providers. We have significant issues with difficulty recruiting gynecology, which is a fairly um, you know, in-demand specialty, to come to work at the VA. So it's a, it's a public messaging issue in recruitment strategies. We very much want to have gynecologists in the VA, um, and we continue to work on recruiting them. Is there anything unique about the, the challenge of hiring them as opposed to demand medical specialties? I think the unique challenge is that many people don't realize that we see women in the VA, and despite the fact that we now see 550,000 women, a lot of the gynecologists aren't looking to that to VA as part of their uh, you know work outlook. So the other you know, challenge is continuing, and particularly working with DOD folks that come out of DOD and retire and, and want to pick up a VA commitment because of their commitment to the mission. Okay, thank you. Um, and last question for me is just uh, my colleague, Ms. Underwood, has a, what I think is a very important bill to um, allow VA to give, to, I believe, 12 months of uh, contraception to its patients as opposed to now, which I think is often closer to 90 days. Um, and some studies, including a study done in VA Pittsburgh near where I represent, showed that uh, that improved uh, compliance and regularity of usage and patient wellness and all that kind of thing to give them a longer supply like that at once. Um, do you have any thoughts or position on that if, if we were to pass that and it became the norm? Certainly, thank you. There has been um, Dr. Barrero's work on this contraception issue. It's tied in two ways. Um, 
one right now veterans do get a 12 month supply but they must renew it every 90 days uh, much like um, most other medications that folks get the the issue actually when we start to dive into it is more tied to the issues about copays our women many times do not have the money to pay 12 months worth of copays at one time and in order to change the copay we need legislative relief so in order to address the issue of you know, 12 months or six months or whatever in contraception, we have to take those two issues on together. Great, thank you for for clarifying that. And I think that I think that Ms. Brownlee, our chair, actually has a bill to do that as well to harmonize that with the ACA. So, uh, Madam Chair, I, I will yield back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Lamb. And now I recognize Dr. Rowe for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Woman, um, a couple of things. One, uh, what Mr. Lamb was just talking about, what I would recommend uh, on the contraceptives is give a three-month supply to start with because you don't know if someone will tolerate them. We don't want to have 12 months worth of medicine and then you find out you can't take it. You, that's expensive. But if you gave someone 90 days, it's well tolerated, pay one copay and then get a year. So that makes absolute sense to me. Number two um, is on the IVF. I want to go to that. I, I very strongly supported that for service-connected disabled veterans. Um, I don't know whether uh, Ms. Brownlee has that out there. That should, if you are catastrophically injured, and we took care of this with the uh, PAV's help in the Mission Act for people who have a, an attendee at home, uh, it makes sense to me to make that a permanent. You're permanently injured. Uh, you're always going to have that problem at, due to service to this great nation, and we should, we should if those uh, veterans want to have a family, and by golly, we ought to do everything we can to be sure they have the same opportunity to have a child and a grandchild that I've had. Um, and I, I, I strongly support making that a permanent um, issue, uh, a benefit, I mean. Um, I don't know how the rest of my colleagues feel about that. I think expanding it to any veteran, I'd have to look at that's a huge cost. But, but to the catastrophic injury veteran, me personally as a veteran, I cannot do enough for them. They, they've made a sacrifice that I never had to make. Um, so I want them to have the same opportunity to have a, a family and, uh, as I said, children and grandchildren that I've had. How, how many of these um, uh, cases are done? Do you all have any idea how many IVF cases for our catastrophic injured veterans are, are performed each year, IVF? I mean, how many that, we talk about 100 or? Right. The numbers that we have right now is that uh, about 800 cases are active in the last year and a half. Okay. So it takes, because it's an extended process, uh, folks can be in and then have another attempt, et cetera. So, but the number of active cases is about 800. Well, just a, a historic shout out. Um, this technique was um, was uh, done by Dr. Patrick Steptoe. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Steptoe before he died. He did 100 laparoscopies for egg retrieval before he had one successful case. And look what that's done 40 years later, where now uh, families now can have children that they otherwise would never have had. Um, uh, also, Mr. Lamb was asking about uh, coverage of uh, gynecologic coverage at our VAs. I think you do need to actively recruit people because, as you pointed out, um, one in five uh, active duty uh, uh, people on the service now are women. And so the VA is going to have to change its model. So I think uh, you need to go out and actively recruit. And I think uh, to have an obstetrical service, I think, makes no sense because you'd never have enough babies in one hospital to have a service. I think that should be, uh, you have to have a certain number to get the expertise where you need the nurses and uh, anesthesia and so forth. But it makes absolute sense to uh, recruit these uh, gynecologists out there. And I would strongly encourage you to do that if you have 24, because most of the work we do, I'm an OBGYN, most of the work we do is outpatient. I mean, we don't, most of the stuff we do, you don't go in the hospital for, you just go to the doctor for various issues. So I would strongly, strongly encourage you to do that. Uh, and I do want to just say this before I finish, because I'm a pro-life uh, obstetrician gynecologist and, and friends can have differences of opinion. I have a very strong opinion about life and I, I will oppose any effort the VA has to explain expand abortion. Um, and I want to make that part of the record right now uh, that I will, I will oppose that with every, every 
every uh, effort in my body to prevent that. I, I think we need to change the hearts and minds. Life is a precious gift from God. And we can have good, good folks can have differences of opinion. That just happens to be mine. What, what can we do uh, to you all, anyone on the panel, what can we do to help you carry out your, increase your, uh, your uh, mission in women's health? If there were a couple things we could do, uh, what could we do? Thank you for asking us that. Uh, we want to continue to expand the services. Uh, we have appreciated Congress's uh, increased appropriations in the area of women's health. And I think the messaging that you can continue to give so that women enroll in VA and use VA, messaging that you can help provide that we are uh, welcoming veterans into this, the system. These are the, the primary things that you can do to assist us. The other things we've been giving you uh, opinions and technical assistance on for some of these corrections that we think would benefit veterans in terms of um, IVF, contraception, some of the other bills that are pending right now, we're happy that we've been asked to give views and, and technical assistance on those. Okay. So, thank you, I yield back. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Rowe. And uh, I now call on Mr. Levin for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair Brownlee, for holding this hearing today, and thank you to uh, our witnesses. Uh, Ms. Elias, you might be aware that we're going to be passing a major infrastructure bill uh, today. So uh, I wanted to ask you, I noticed in your testimony, uh, there was reference to the infrastructure barriers that veterans with disabilities uh, face. Uh, given the prevalence of spinal cord injury or disorder in the veteran population, BHA should be leading the way in accessibility. Uh, no veteran's care should be compromised because the facility cannot accommodate their wheelchair or a portable lift. Uh, so what is your sense of the scale of these issues in VA? Thank you for that question, Chairman Levin. Um, it's definitely an issue that we hear about commonly from our women veterans in particular, and not just within the VA, but sometimes even when they're sent out into the community uh, for care from the VA, they're sent to a provider who doesn't have the staffing or sent to a, um, a provider that doesn't always have the necessary equipment to make sure that they can have a safe and accessible exam. Uh, as far as the measuring the uh, amount of, of how much that is affected within the VA, that's something that I could take for the record and work with the um, medical services team that we have to get you a more specific number, but it is something that our veterans are reporting to us commonly. Thank you. That would be great. And uh, I was proud to successfully advocate for almost $3.4 billion in VA infrastructure funding as part of this uh, bill today. Uh, and it's critical that VA direct these funds to urgent needs, such as ensuring accessible infrastructure that considers the needs of women veterans. Uh, Dr. Hayes, to what extent is the Office of Women's Health Services involved in VHA infrastructure planning? Thank you, Mr. Levin. Uh, we actually are quite involved in the infrastructure planning. We sit on the board of the SCIP, the Strategic Capital Assets Planning Group, and review all of the requests that come in that say they're trying to address women veterans' issues in their plan. So my team reviews actually every plan that says that it's going to benefit women veterans. In addition, we at our local level do um, the environment of care rounds and do the walk arounds and try and identify the kinds of situations you're speaking of. Uh, we very much want to support uh, things like making sure we have wheelchair accessible exam tables that go to wheelchair height so that people can have a dignified exam, et cetera. So we are involved in all these levels. Terrific. Well, I, I welcome your feedback in our uh, uh, build today and in the months ahead. Uh, I also understand VA, switching gears for a second, currently does not report maternal health disparities based on race or ethnicity. Uh, we know black women represent 30% of women using VHA and are three times more likely to die in childbirth than white women in the US. So I'm extremely concerned that we lack important data in order to understand the extent of these disparities in the veteran population and therefore to address them. Why does VA not report this data, and will you consider doing so given the American people's renewed demands to address racial and ethnic disparities in our country? I'd certainly like Dr. Christie to answer that question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Levin. Uh, I first want to say the health of our, our pregnant uh, women veterans is one of our very highest priorities. Uh, as you know, obstetrical care is delivered in the community, 
and it has been a challenge with obtaining that medical information and incorporating it in the VA record. We are collecting that data, and we believe that information will be very helpful to us in making clinical recommendations and providing the highest obstetrical care for our women veterans. And we, as you mentioned, are, um, it's important to also collect demographic data, which is also being done. And we believe all of that information will be instrumental in improving the obstetrical care that's delivered to our, our women veterans. Are you gonna report that data though was my question? Yes, we yes. are. Do you have any sense of timing on when you will? Um, I don't have an exact date. Uh, we do have a maternity database. We do have a maternity care survey that's um, ongoing, but I don't have a, a definite date. Okay, last uh, question uh, with the time I have. Uh, obviously, we're all dealing with COVID-19. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm hearing that veterans, uh, in some cases, must repeatedly call their facility to make an appointment uh, for COVID-19 related needs as they're not proactively notified when in-person care resumes. Could be COVID or could be other needs that they have. So Dr. Uh, Hayes, what steps will VA take to improve communication with veterans about the availability of care during the COVID-19 pandemic? We believe that uh, we've been ramping up. It's very important that veterans be hooked into our electronic mechanisms. If they send a secure message to their team and their provider, it will be seen immediately. They don't have to wait on a phone line. And in that same mechanism, we're using social media when they're not being called directly uh, to get out the word about what's happening at their local facility, how is it reopening. We also have emails of many of our veterans and sending messages directly to them. We have been concerned that veterans have had difficulty at various sites. We are hearing that ourselves, and we're trying to remedy that by making sure that they get the word out in multiple ways. Well, thank you. I'm out of time. I thank you for your work on behalf of our veterans, and I'll yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Levin, and I just wanted to follow up on um, on his question with regards to your involvement in women facilities across the country. Do you do outreach to make sure that those facilities that don't have services for women or facilities uh, dedicated to women, do you reach out to them to try to influence them to pursue that? Uh, yes, ma'am. We actually do more than outreach. We do site visits, and we've been continuing those site visits with the, the person at the VISN level to do walk-around site visits. I haven't been hearing of places that don't have the right facilities for women for exams and things, so I'll be very anxious to hear from that from PVA and what they're reporting. But we are sending people to the ground to make sure this is getting fixed. We know we've, for example, fixed so there's no longer a clinic that doesn't have a bathroom. There's no longer an inpatient psych unit that doesn't have a women's bathroom, et cetera. So we've been doing this through site visits. Yeah, I think that there is. We probably should talk about a universal standard of what that should look like mm -hmm. um, across the board because I, we know when we walk into a wonderful facility for women um, and we know uh, walking into a facility that is mediocre. Um, at best. Uh, so I think we really should talk about having a standard. So anyway, um, uh, Ms. Radawagan, I recognize you for five minutes for questioning. You may need to unmute. Uh, not hearing from Ms. Rodawagon, we'll recognize Mr. Brindisi for five minutes for questioning. Mr. Brindisi? Not hearing from Mr. Brindisi, we will go to Ms. Underwood. Ms. Underwood, you're recognized for five minutes. Not hearing from Ms. Underwood uh, as well. So um, we will go to another round of questions. I know I have some more questions. Um, and if other members here do, we will go, I, I will certainly recognize you. So um, 
I wanted to ask um, Ms. Williams um, a question around abortion. So, um, and I, I certainly honor Dr. Rowe's um, opinion and when what he expressed earlier, we obviously are friends and have a different perspective on this particular issue. But how does the VA's outright ban, I mean, it is truly an outright ban on abortion and abortion counseling uh, represent a particularly harsh inequity, including when compared with other federal programs. If Ms. Williams, if you could address that, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Chairwoman Brownlee. What it means, as I mentioned in my opening statement, is that a woman veteran who's been sexually assaulted leaves active duty because of that and expects to be able to get abortion care that she would have been able to get on active duty, turns and goes to VA, she's not able to get equitable care. It means that if I had a pregnancy that my provider believed was life-threatening to, to me, not only would they be unable to provide it, but they would be unable to counsel me that I needed to seek that care elsewhere. And that I think is, is really deeply disturbing, very concerning that women veterans are unable to access care that they and their provider believe is necessary for them to have the, um, the, the safe and healthy outcomes that they need for themselves and their families. Well, uh, thank you for that. And, um, you know, I uh, certainly on this issue, I think uh, the fact that even, I mean, the VA has the absolute ban, um, uh, you know, of any agency. There are other places where women can get abortion counseling and an abortion if that is her choice. Um, but particularly on the abortion counseling piece, the fact that you know, medical professionals, when they're looking at the whole health of an of uh, of a woman's health, um, y you know, cannot you know bring that up. And I I, I think that doctors, you know, take a Hippocratic oath, um, you know, to care uh, fully care for the uh, for the patient. And it would seem to me that you know it would be a conflict. I think for many of the medical professionals uh, within the the VA. Um, as well. So the other line of questioning that I wanted to ask the VA is, um, you know, it, it's, this is really more about uh, research into uh, reproductive health and particularly women's uh, reproductive health. Um, I don't think we have any yet any conclusive research that connects environmental uh, exposure such as burn, pit, burn pits uh, with a detrimental impact on, on reproductive health. But what we do know is that women veterans do have a higher rate of uh, reproductive cancers um, at, a, at a younger age, including breast cancer, um, at, at a higher rate than non-veteran women do, and at the at the younger age. So, um, and in 2015, two of the most common service-connected conditions in women veterans were related to reproductive health, um, and, and a total a total or partial hysterectomy among the most common service-connected conditions in women veterans, which was more common than degenerative arthritis of the spine or, or, or tinnitus. I never know how to pronounce that, Ten, tinnitus, tinnitus. Um, uh, so can you speak to that? That to me is just an alarming, a very alarming statistic actually. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman uh, Brownlee. There is currently uh, research and work ongoing to uh, look at uh, reproductive health service connected conditions and also research to specifically look at um, hysterectomy um, numbers, access to, for instance, minimally invasive surgery. And some of the initial data indicates that the access, the disparities in access to services like minimally invasive surgery is less within in the VA. Uh, there's also ongoing research uh, looking at the issues of military exposures through the Gulf War Office and in collaboration with a number of other uh, federal agencies. 
Um, there is ongoing research looking at um, infertility among veterans, uh, which will hopefully be published within the next year. So there are many um, ongoing studies and efforts to look at these issues and to look at the etiologies for things like the disparate number of hysterectomies among women veterans compared to the general population. Well, uh, thank you, and I'm encouraged to hear that uh, some of that research is going on. So um, I understand Ms. Radawagen is now with us, and if so, I recognize you, Ms. Radawagen, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Brownlee and, and the ranking member for holding this hearing. Thank you to uh, the panel for their appearance today. It's uh, beautiful here in Pango Pango, American Samoa at uh, four o'clock in the morning. Uh, I do appreciate the uh, effort this committee has been making on behalf of women veterans, including hearings like these and the establishment of the Women's Veterans Task Force. I want to express how proud and grateful I am to be a part of this. And I hope our work will make some real changes to benefit veterans of all genders. Dr. Hayes, in a statement for the record, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists testifies that there is a significant lack of data on maternal health outcomes of veterans. Is that a research topic that VA is exploring? Why or why not? What other research is underway within VA on reproductive health care access, outcomes, and barriers among veterans? And does any of that research include reproductive mental health for both male and female veterans, which PBA's testimony notes is particularly under-researched. Yes, I, I'm gonna have Dr. Christie answer most of that, but I wanna uh, reinforce the notion that yes, we are very interested in maternal health outcomes, and we wanna make sure that we're covering that. We're also interested in outcomes for IVF and working with the CDC to get that data at this point in time. But I'd like Dr. Christie to elaborate a bit on that question. We are doing ongoing research looking at obstetrical outcomes, and as I, I mentioned earlier, that will be uh, reported. We are doing ongoing uh, research to look at exposures. We're doing ongoing research uh, looking at uh, reproductive health conditions and whether or not the incidence is greater among women veterans. Uh, so we do have a very uh, robust research agenda and partnering with um, a number of other offices such as Gulf War Health and also as Dr. Hayes mentioned with the CDC who tracks the IVF outcomes for the United States who will be looking specifically at veteran outcomes uh, with IVF. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you so much, and thank you for waking up bright and early in the morning to join us. We appreciate your service to the committee, so thank you very much. And I now recognize Ms. Underwood uh, for five minutes of questioning. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our panel of witnesses. Many veterans, especially younger women veterans, rely on VHA for contraceptive care. Of course, reliable, uninterrupted access to information on a range of contraceptive outcomes and to contraception is essential women's health care. But in the middle of a global pandemic, seeing your provider for a refill of your prescription um, and visiting a pharmacy even can be really challenging. And so what steps has VHA taken to prevent gaps in contraceptive coverage during this pandemic? That question's for Dr. Hayes. Thank you, Ms. Underwood. Thank you so much for that question. We actually uh, not only perceived that that might be an issue, but we took action immediately. We have providers working uh, to actually fix the system ahead of time so that they don't run out and getting more refills available. Our prescriptions come by mail. If it's an injectable, we've actually uh, changed over the mechanism. Some places had drive-through injections for the contraception, and in other situations, we've changed the formulation so that the veteran can self-inject and receive that uh, injection by mail, and then using video 
telehealth with the nurse or the f f provider to make sure they're doing it correctly the first time. So we, we really Excellent. are concerned about contraception during this time and have done quite a bit to take that challenge on. Thank you. Last year, VA published a study with the University of Pittsburgh on a one-year dispensing option for oral contraceptives. The study found that dispensing a year-long supply rather than just three or four months worth improves health outcomes for women and it lowers the cost for the VA. And in a pandemic, it could also potentially decrease a woman's risk of disease exposure. Dr. Hayes, has VA looked into expanding one-year contraception dispensing during this pandemic? And if so, how many women currently served by VA have this option? Hello. Uh, right now, VA does not have the 12-month dispensing option, and it's tied to both um, internal policy, which we can fix, but also the copay options. As I said, though, a person gets 12 months, they just get them every 90 days, and so their lower copay is attached to that, and we need um, legislative relief to deal with that. I might also say that we've actually uh, been looking into that study uh, with Pittsburgh, and there actually isn't data that shows that the lack of the 12-month in any way increase the number of unintended pregnancies. And that's another piece that we have to take a look at to make sure we can actually look in our data. We're setting that up to take a look at that factor. So we want the health of the woman to be improved. We want her to have easy access to contraception. And we also want to make sure that we're helping her with unintended, unplanned pregnancies. So all of those factors are going into this uh, current effort. Yes, ma'am. I'm really glad to hear that you're looking at all the potential clinical outcomes of which unintended pregnancy is just one. Uh, purpose of a woman taking contraceptives. I would encourage VA to prioritize expanding one-year contraception dispensing. It's an evidence-based practice that improves women's health and saves money. As you know, I have a bill on this issue, the ACE Veterans Act, and I'm looking forward to working with VA to make year-long dispensing a reality for VA patients. I also want to discuss our nation's maternal mortality crisis and how this impacts women veterans. The number of women veterans served by VA is growing rapidly, but there's still not enough demand to provide obstetric care in VA facilities. So VA partners with community-based maternity care providers. It's essential to ensure that these community providers are held to the highest standards of care. Dr. Hayes, what specific steps is VA taking to prevent adverse maternal health outcomes, including maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity among women veterans receiving care outside of the VA facilities. I'd, I'd actually like to turn that to my reproductive expert here uh, who's helping us track our maternity care and women veterans, Dr. Christie. Thank you for that question. As you know, we have maternity care coordinator program who help coordinate the community care and the care within VA. And as Dr. Hayes mentioned earlier, all of these women were contacted uh, during the pandemic to provide resources and information to them. As we mentioned, we are also collecting the data on obstetrical outcomes, and that will help inform recommendations going forward. But we are very proud of, and we feel the program has been very successful uh, with the maternity care coordinators. And it is a program that the veterans have been uh, very happy with, and we feel that um, the quality of care that they are able to receive uh, with the coordination of the, of the MCCs has, has really been outstanding. And we think that that will go a long way in not only care coordination, but improving outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Christie. The Protecting Moms Who Served Act, bipartisan legislation that I introduced with my colleague, on the Women's Veterans Task Force, Dr. Billy Rockus would provide funding to support maternity care coordination through the VA. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Underwood, um, for your line of questioning. And Dr. Dunn, do you have any additional questions? I would, I would like, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would like to uh, say a couple of words. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, uh, express my appreciation uh, for Representative Amata Radawagon, uh, uh, she who most routinely makes the single most punishing uh, uh, commute in Congress, and and by the way, was literally prevented from returning to her home for months uh, in the quarantine. So it's it's uh, it's great to see you again, Amata. Thank you so much for your for your participation. Uh, I enjoyed your comment, Madam Chair, about uh, tinnitus, or tinnitus as our British friends pronounce it. Uh, my first couple of years in the military were in, my MOS was artillery, 
and uh, and uh, so I can I can testify uh, on this subject in tedious detail. Uh, and let me say that the VA health system does a terrific job with uh, audiology and, and hearing aid support. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I will remind the panel of the questions that I was uh, looking for answers for, which will be forthcoming, I hope, uh, sometime soon. And then I want to ask one question, uh, one perhaps one further report going forward. In our memo, reference was made to the fact that there is actually a higher in, uh, reported number of male sexual trauma than female sexual trauma. I honestly, 17 years in multi, I did not know that in, in, in the medical corps. So... Um, uh, leaves me puzzled uh, a little bit about it. And I asked if you would prov would provide a scholarly medical article or two on the subject so that I may understand that uh, in the future. And I know you can't answer that question in five minutes. I won't ask you to, but you know, a scholarly article would, or several would be appreciated. I'd but, be happy to do that. I wanted to clarify that the VA statistics would show that the percent of men who report oh yeah, it's much lower it's much lower but the total numbers of men in the va when you take the one and a half two percent who say who report their military sexual trauma experiences yeah i get the raw data the raw, raw numbers data. are higher but the incidence is very very different and women are much much higher right but i just want to understand i actually We'd be happy to provide in, in all the time i was in i i just didn't get that sense and so i was I'd like to know more and with that madam chair you're back thank you Thank you, Dr. Dunn. And uh, Dr. Rowe, do you have additional questions? I do. A couple of things. One, uh, and this is maybe an unfair question, but how does the VA um, define maternal mortality? And let me tell you why I say, I say that, because when you're comparing statistics from around the world, uh, and we've noted that our maternal mortality rate in the United States has gone up, but here's the World Health Organization the death of a woman while pregnant or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy, irrespective of the duration and site of the pregnancy, so it doesn't matter how far along you are, from any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy or its management, but not from accidental or incidental causes. Adding to the WHO definition, the CDC extends the period of consideration to include up to one year within the end of the pregnancy, regardless of the outcome. So they, the CDC also would include a car wreck. So when you compare the mortality statistics in this country to otherwise, you've got to have the same definition. And I would strongly encourage the VA to provide that data to see if we're doing a good job in the VA and, and, and then disaggregate the data by, by demography, by race, by um, whatever. And I think that's impor important information. And I don't know whether we need to do anything or not, but I would I would strongly encourage you to uh, to do that. That's well advised, sir. We'll take that. Are you going to do it? I guess I'm asking. Absolutely, we'll, we'll define what what statistics we're using, which definitions we're using as we do the mor maternal mortality and, data, and then give us the data. Yes, sir. Okay, that's that's great. I think we'll we'll appreciate that. And uh, just a, a, a one more um, comment. Um, I practiced, uh, I, this December, I graduated from medical school 50 years ago. And you know it's time to retire as I am this year when your physical therapist who takes care of your shoulder, you delivered him. And the, your opponent, if you ran again, you delivered him. So you, you know it's time to go home when that happens. So I've, I've had a long experience as an obstetrician. And I do want to clarify some things about abortion. Um, there is no medical indication for a third trimester abortion. And I will invite anybody who wants to come sit at that dais to make that debate with me. My practice delivered over 25,000 babies while I was in practice with them. I delivered almost 5,000 babies myself personally. And in the third trimester, if you deliver a baby, when I started my practice in 1977 in Johnson City, Tennessee, the mortality rate for a 32-week baby was 50%. The mortality rate for that baby today is the same as a term baby. That's how far our neonatology friends have come. We've now pushed the survival rate down to 22, 23 weeks, and we even count the days. And I can't tell you how many moms I sat by their bedside trying to get them one more day in utero so, so that that baby could survive or have a chance to survive. And I recall a baby 
uh, that we delivered who got to 14 ounces. I won't say the name for privacy reasons. And I saw that child two years later knocking everything off the shelf of a Walmart when I was there. The only thing he had was glasses, and I said, well, I've worn them for most of my life. So it, it's, it's an, obviously the, the debate can be had, but you can't make that debate based on a medical indication because you simply deliver the baby and then take care of the medical indication. And I'd be more than willing to discuss that, debate that with anybody on this planet. With that, I yield back. So with, with permission from the chairwoman, uh, I'm going to add, elaborate a little bit on one of his comments. He talked about the infant mortality rate, and, and it's not strictly, let's face it, in the purview of the veterans' health system, but, but you people throw these numbers around all the time and, and disparage the United States' uh, infant mortality rate. We are not talking about the same definition of infant mortality in the United States as we are in Germany or Netherlands or Japan or any of these other countries where they claim to have a lower infant mortality. It simply isn't true. The, di the definitions that they use are very, very dissimilar from our definitions. And, and we, we count any baby born who takes a breath, and, and, and they, they count babies uh, only after three months and things like that, and it changes from country to country. So I, I, I really – I fought this as the incoming president of the Florida Medical Association. I fought this thing, uh, this, these numbers on the, in the state house, and I, I think it – I ask you all to bear in mind that, that a lot of the statistics that are popularly quoted are quite inaccurate. And then, and also, if I would say to uh, my good friend, Dr. Rose, uh, long and noble history as a doctor, you know, Hippocrates himself said, life is short, the art is long, and the decisions are hard. With that, Madam Chair, you will back. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. And Ms. Underwood, do you, do you have additional questions that you'd like to um, inquire at this moment? Oh, yes, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for yielding additional time. And thank you for having this hearing today on this very important topic. Um, I want to return back to the Protecting Moms Who Served Act um, and the line of questioning there. It's, again, bipartisan legislation that I introduced with my colleague on the Women Veterans Task Force, Representative Billy Rockus, that would provide funding to support maternity care coordination through the VA. Some of that funding would go towards ensuring that pregnant and postpartum women veterans receive the mental health screenings and treatments that they need and deserve. Dr. Hayes, how do experiences that disproportionately affect women veterans like PTSD, moral injury, and military sexual trauma exacerbate maternal mental health risks? So thank you. We're very concerned about uh, the fact that about 42% of our women veterans have a mental health condition, regardless of whether they're planning a family or not. And so we're very concerned going into it that we maintain screening, that we look for depression and anxiety conditions in women, and that those who already uh, come in with conditions have uh, collaborative treatment for their ongoing mental health conditions as well as their pregnancy. So we do the screening. We have reproductive mental health. We uh, have now instituted a reproductive mental health consultation team to provide added expertise to be able to manage the mental health condition, to look at the possibility of teratogenicity or, or birth defect potential in the drugs and help our providers to balance those needs. Uh, and the other thing that we're well aware of and that we're tracking both in terms of research and, and our maternity care coordination is that if you have a condition like PTSD, that you're at much higher risk during your pregnancy and you're at risk for preterm labor uh, and delivery and that there are other associated risks that we're still trying to uh, develop and investigate so that we can be alerted in advance, our maternity care coordinators and the obstetricians in the community can continue to address these concerns in terms of the whole arena of reproductive mental health. Well, I'm certainly glad to hear that you, uh, that the VA providers are working uh, both within the VA to offer these services and in partnership uh, with those community providers. The Protecting Moms Who Served Act also commissions a comprehensive study on maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity among women veterans with a focus on racial and ethnic disparities in maternal health outcomes. Dr. Hayes, what are the most significant barriers to collecting, reporting, and assessing data on maternal health outcomes for women veterans, particularly women veterans of color? So as we said, we're very concerned about the issues of health equity. I don't think we let you all know that 44% of our women veterans are other than white. We're very concerned about the subpopulation of veterans 
and how this interacts with their health conditions and their own uh, beliefs about health, healthcare, and their goals for themselves in terms of health. So as we go forward and continue to look at these issues about not just mortality, but all the complications of pregnancy and birth, and uh, taking into account this issue about how we make our definitions, we're also looking into how we can best collect the data. The problem, of course, has been that the data has been outside the VA and not part of our electronic health system. Some things that are going to help with that are the, the new uh, things that are coming in with the community care network and the transfer of data into the VA records. Um, and the other is maternity care coordination, actually documenting the community care coordinator, documenting in the record the ongoing care and the resultant outcomes for mom and baby as uh, we go forward. So those have been in the barriers. We're working on them steadily, but there's still some barriers there in terms of outside care uh, records coming into VA. And Dr. Hayes, as part of the relationships that the VA has with these outside providers, is there a requirement to share this type of clinical data? Yes, the, the data is required to come back into the VA. And uh, part of it, frankly, has been really technology issues. I see. Once it comes in, how does it get loaded up into the VA record? So and all these issues about the cloud. I'm sorry. So essentially, once that technologic solution is resolved, um, and I'm assuming that's part of this e larger EHR work that we've been talking about on our committee and that the VA has been working on for uh, a number of years now, um, we will receive like a backlog of data ready to be analyzed. No, I cannot promise that we'll have the backlog of data. I can promise that we'll be going forward and we'll do our best on the backlogs. I but see. We, we know we can go forward once we have this, the fixes in place. Thank you. And for the record, um, during my prior line of questioning, uh, Dr. Hayes mentioned that there was a barrier regarding contraceptive co-pays. And I just wanted to state for the record that we do have introduced a bill, the Veterans Preventive Health Coverage Fairness Act, that removes co-pay requirements for preventive medications and services um, and expand covered services that are authorized under the U.S. Public I'm sorry, Preventive Services Task Force, which would include contraceptive. Thank you again to our witnesses for appearing today and Madam Chair for extending the additional time. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Underwood. And Ms. Radawagan, do you have additional questions? No, I have no additional questions at this time. Well, thank you. Uh, again, thank you for your our participation in the hearing. And um, uh, we really do. Um, uh, honor your presence. So thank you for that. And um, I just had one last question and then we're going to close. And that is, um, last year there was a case of a service member who preserved his, his sperm and then eventually died of suicide. Do, are you familiar with this case at all? But um, apparently that service ma member automatically becomes a veteran for the purposes of benefits. Um, and as such, his wife uh, believed that the VA should cover I IUI or IVF uh, with her husband's preserved sperm. Can you speak to what happens in such a case? Yes, Madam Chairman. Uh, unfortunately, that particular situation would also be covered by the restrictions of the policy that we must follow from DOD. But I would have to get you the legal opinion from Office of General Counsel I believe that once the veteran has passed away, we're not allowed to use their sperm uh, going forward. Okay, thank you. I'd like to pursue that uh, with, with you at, at, a, at a later date. So, and I, Dr. Hayes, I appreciate uh, you uh, being here. And actually, I appreciate the, the point I want to make is I really appreciate your candidness and honesty in terms of uh, your testimony and responses uh, to our questions. We appreciate it very much. So um, I want to thank uh, everyone for joining us today. Uh, access to health care is a human right, and that includes all reproductive health care, including access to an abortion and abortion counseling. It's clear that the VA health care system is the best place for women veterans with service-connected conditions and complex health histories including military sexual trauma and combat trauma to receive their care at the VA. We also uh, have work to do, I think, to ensure that the VA remains a leader in conducting research and providing evidence-based treatments uh, to our nation's veterans, um, and particularly with regard to their reproductive health and certainly the hysterectomy issue that I, that I brought up earlier in the hearing. 
Um, veterans frequently belong to communities who are already marginalized and face systemic and economic barriers to their health care. We must eliminate all those barriers so that all veterans, including women, uh, people of color, LGBTQ veterans, uh, and those living in rural area, areas, tribal areas, and U.S. territories have full reproductive freedom. Women veterans who wish to specifically learn about resources available to them can call or text the Women's the Women Veterans Call Center at 1-855-VA-WOMEN. Again, that number is 1-855-VA-WOMEN. So I look forward to continuing our conversation so that all veterans receive the health care they have earned and deserved. And with that ranking member, uh, with that ranking member done, I would like, if you would like to offer any closing remarks. Very good, Dr. Dunn. I mean, Dr. Rowe, sorry. Okay, again, uh, so thank you all uh, for being here. And without objection, this concludes uh, to t today's hearings. Uh, all members will have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials. The hearing is now adjourned.